Welcome to Bullshift the Podcast, where for the next half hour or so, we'll be exploring behavioral biases in the financial services industry. And specifically, we'll be talking about how the industry shifts your attention to be more bullish. My name is John DeGuy. I'm the author of the book, Bullshift, and the host of the podcast. My guest this week is Reverend Michael Korn. And Michael is a person who probably doesn't need an introduction, but I would be remiss if I didn't give him one anyway. He's a master of divinity uh, and was, in day, was ordained by the Anglican Church in, uh, in 2019 and made a priest in October of 2021. He's won the, uh, the Ed Murrow Award for radio broadcasting. He's won the RTDNDA Radio Broadcasting Award, uh, the Communicator Award in Hollywood, and in 2008, he won the Omni Award for his television show. In 2012, he was awarded the Queen's Jubilee Medal for his services for the media. And in 2013, he was named North American Columnist of the Year at the Catholic Press Association Awards. He's a columnist for the Toronto Star, a frequent contributor to the Globe and Mail, and the author of 18 books. Reverend Michael Korn, thank you so much for joining me. I love the way you said I was a master of divinity. I mean, it sounds like I'm a master <laughs> of divinity. I do have a master's of divinity degree. Uh -huh. Not quite as impressive as being a master of divinity, but I'll take it. Okay, good. Uh, forgive me for, uh, for getting that, that little de detail oh. incorrect. Uh, how are you today? I'm pretty well, actually. Um, yeah, I'm feeling quite, I mean, at my age, you know, waking up in the morning is a bonus. So uh, <laughs> I'm feeling okay. I, I wanted to begin by talking to you about the holiday season and when what you say when you greet people. Do, when you see someone and you want to uh, wish them the best of the season, do you say Merry Christmas or do you say Happy Holidays or do you say Seasons Greetings? What do you say? Well, I say Merry Christmas because I'm a Christian and a priest. Um, I have no problem with people not saying that, though. Right. It really is irrelevant. You know, there's always someone who claims there's a war on Christmas which is a point entirely. There's not a war on Christmas. There's a war on Christmas values. There's a war on Christian values. But that's something entirely different. And some of the, the people who get most upset about the alleged war on Christmas are quite conservative people. Right. And I have to say that some of those people are, the, are the, the biggest critics of Christian values, which are forgiveness and equality and kindness and peace and so on. Right. I, I wanted to begin by talking about morality, and I think that's a, a good segue here. So um, there are lots of different definitions, and, and I, I think if you were to think, if you were to ask 20 people, you'd probably get about 17 or 18 different ones. But it's been defined as being the differentiation between intentions and decisions and actions, uh, and what's distinguished as being proper and what's distinguished as being improper. Where would you draw the line in terms of how you would define uh, morality in in a way that sort of could be applied to an ordinary man or woman on the street? I suppose the basis of my morality is love God with all your heart, soul and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you can work on those two, everything else is just a footnote, particularly, uh, certainly in scripture. But the idea, I know it sounds very simple, but uh, trying to love your neighbor as yourself, trying to love other people as you want to be loved, as you want to be treated. If we can all work at that then the world would be a much better place i mean it, individual morality it depends um are we talking about kindness or goodness or selflessness um i've met deeply i think moral people who have no faith mm -hmm. in anything beyond the the here and now i've met deeply moral people of different religions and i've met people of my own faith who i don't think are particularly moral so i mean it, i i would say that why love your neighbor as yourself is so profound, although it sounds so simple, is that people claim that morality changes. I don't think it really does. Um, maybe the way they phrase it and frame it can change. But uh, C.S. Lewis, the great uh, intellectual and Christian writer, he talks about uh, what is what is fair and what isn't fair. And he said, so let's say that um, you, you accidentally um, trip someone on a as they're walking along and let's say you try to trip someone but you fail to trip them you know, which is the moral action and which isn't and these are very interesting issues but i prefer to actually get into the nuts and bolts of living them 
than than discussing them. There's a lot of books written about morality and ethics and so on, and theology, too many in my opinion. Right. Right. But as a priest, a lot of what I do is, is to deal with people, or just today, um, giving a shopping cards to people for $25 each, I wish we could give more, who really, that, that means a lot to them. Dealing with people who have to decide whether they're going to put a meal on the table that night or pay a bill. Um, that's when morality does hit the ground and you have to decide what is right and what is wrong. I mean, certainly, I don't believe it's a moral world when people have more money than they could ever spend and other people are desperately poor and may even see their children die. And that must be um, a profoundly immoral situation. And that has to change. I'm wondering, as that pertains to, say, the professions, so doctors, dentists, lawyers, accountants, um, these are all people who have um, opportunities throughout the course of their careers to be moral and to perhaps fudge the line in terms of uh, what, what is moral and what is not. My experience is that the very, very vast majority of professionals uh, have good intentions. They, they, they mean well, and they want to do their job with, uh, with diligence and, and professionalism and, and candor and, and, and so forth. I'm wondering about uh, sort of getting about your, your point about uh, intending to trip and fail versus uh, not intending to trip, but nonetheless tripping. Um, where, where you might think in terms of things like disclosures. Um, if you're a surgeon and you have to disclose certain risks about what might go wrong with the surgery, or if you're a tax preparer and, and the interpretation of, a, of, a, of an element of the tax act is somewhat gray and, and the person whose taxes are being done has to sign off, where do you think the line should be drawn for professionals in terms of making disclosures and offering the advice that they give? Well, they're very different things. Uh, I had surgery three months, like three, four months ago. Uh, not dangerous. So, well, I mean, I was under for six hours. It was heart surgery, but it was for atrial fibrillation. So it wasn't really, as heart surgery goes, it was the least dangerous. It wasn't really. It sounds worse than it was. But as I was ready to go in, surgeon came up and he had to read to me the risks that were involved. And he read them. And I, I think I said something like, go forth and multiply but i didn't use that phrase and he laughed and i said what would you do and i mean i had it done but that i love my accountant as i do and he's a wonderful man and i think a deeply ethical man um very fond of him dealing with money and dealing with life are very different and a doctor has to acknowledge uh, the risks i mean that you have to be the be a very fine cardiologist i know will say to you I can only offer you the menu. I can tell you what's on offer. I can't tell you what to choose. Mm -hmm. And, but it, in terms of the professions, here's what I think is, is interesting. A nurse, and nurses are often absolutely vital in patient care and in medical recovery. What they are paid compared, say, to um, someone who works in, in finance. Mm -hmm. These are moral issues. Doctors deserve, I mean, they work very hard and they do, they do wonderful work. Um, I have family, who, a number of uh, people in my family who are nurses. Imagine being a nurse who works in an intensive care unit and looking at your paycheck at the end of uh, each week, each month, every two weeks, and looking at other people who are paid so much more for doing jobs that aren't actually particularly important. I mean, I'm, the jobs you've mentioned are important. But uh, when it comes to accountancy, you know far better than I do that there are people who pay very little tax um, and society will target someone who is, I don't know, defrauding the welfare system of a couple of thousand dollars and say, get them, get them. But someone who is defrauding the system of, of tax of maybe millions of dollars, they'll say, oh, that's clever. And Donald Trump said that. Donald, when Do Donald Trump was accused of not paying tax, he said, yeah, I I'm clever, aren't I? Other <laughs> people would say, well, yeah. That's immoral. Yeah, that's that's the saying that people use in finance, that uh, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. Uh, and so you, you just have to just not not be too overt in what you're doing. Let's since you mentioned Donald Trump, I, that's actually good. You know, he was uh, he announced his intention to run for the nomination for the Republicans a while back. And I was speaking or I overheard someone talking about it, saying, you know, I, I watched his uh, his uh, press conference on TV. And I don't think the guy said a single thing that was true the whole time, which brings up uh, another issue, which is separate and distinct yet again, which is misinformation. And I'm, I'm wondering uh, maybe what your thoughts are on that, just in general. 
Well, Trump has legitimized lying to a certain extent, but I think he's a product rather than a cause. Uh, misinformation has, has been occurring for centuries. I mean, There's nothing new. What's new is the means of delivering this. So we now have social media and so on. Uh, and well, I've been a victim of it. People have told lies about me. I, 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 I'm insulted and abused on social media all the time, and that's fair enough. I don't really care. But people have told lies about me, I mean, actual lies about things that I've done. And it's very difficult in a way because if you respond to it, you're only you're, you're putting fuel on the fire. But uh, dishonesty in politics, in particular, um, it's a roaring trade. Uh, I'm quite active on Twitter, still am. Let's see what happens in the future with what <laughs> happened there. And yet, it is quite incredible the things that you will that you will read and see. I, mean, I, I welcome media being more popular or not popular, being more populist, more open to people. Um, it does add a certain democratic flavor to what's going on. But at the same time, the other side of that is that anyone can give their opinion. And often those opinions have no filter of editing. So in the past, you know, my, my dad, God rest his soul, would come back from, from work and say, um, it says this in the newspaper. And generally it will be true. But that doesn't apply anymore. Yeah. I read this on a, I saw this on a podcast. I read this on a website. I saw this on a media platform. And it's simply not true. Uh, and yet it, it gains a certain credibility. And, um, but the art of, um, some, someone once said that truth is the first casualty of war. And that is true to a degree. But we've gone long past that now. I mean, when the president of the United States, and in this case, wanting to be again the president of the United States, is a, a, a serial liar. All politicians are told lies, but this man is a serial liar. I mean, so much of what he says is simply untrue. And you can see there is an indifference. It's not that he thinks, mm, I'll tell a lie here. He just doesn't care. It's become he, knows he doesn't really need to. Yeah. So I, for what it's worth, uh, since I met you uh, a while back, I've been following you on Twitter, and I enjoy your commentary because it's always refreshing. It's always positive and optimistic. Uh, but you are not afraid to call people out, which I think is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And um, I'm wondering now, since we're talking about misinformation and social media, and a lot of people say that a lot of what you do when you're on social media is that you, you have to curate your feed. You have to decide who you're going to uh, follow and who you're going to take seriously. What, what advice would you give to people to better curate the veracity of whatever information they, they receive and, and might consume? Well, I don't follow many people. It's mainly a, a few friends and one or two others. Um, and certainly when you tweet, I mean, tw Twitter is changing as we speak, but assuming it remains effectively the same, I would I would certainly advise before you tweet anything, uh, think about it. Maybe even delete it, look at it on another page. I use, I, I have used in the past, I've used Facebook to experiment because Twitter is like Facebook on crack. So you need to slow it down and see how people react. Uh, but you have to... I think we all know now there's a lot of dishonesty on Twitter. I and mean, we've seen this in particular with the, the anti-vaccination nonsense, conspiracy theories, anti-Semitism and other. I mean, it's just horrible what is what is out there. I think most people have a pretty healthy filter. They know. But I knew someone Well, I didn't know him. I knew someone who knew him who in Britain infiltrated the, the neo-Nazi right. Um, he was a he, he was a police officer and he infiltrated a far right group and he said part of the problem was that even though he did very well and people were arrested in the end he said but when you hear this stuff all day every day it starts to sort of bleed into your consciousness mm -hmm. because it becomes the new normal right. and you've got to be very very careful about that and if people are bombarding you with lies about vaccinations and conspiracies and who rules the world and what people's motives are and so on it can be very, very dangerous and damaging. And we, we've seen that historically. Um, and we've seen it historically with newspapers and radio. So imagine how bad it can be with social media. So I think I, I would ask people to w read widely, to think very hard for themselves. I, I still have a lot of faith in people. I think there's a lot of common sense out there. But often the loudest noise, the loudest splashing is in the shallowest end of the swimming pool. Mm -hmm. And so people who really have very little to say and limited intellect, with all due respect, make the loudest noise. It's interesting because uh, as a person who, you know, works in the finance industry and, and who writes about it and who comments 
with other people who do it, um, my, you know, my experience is that the very, very large majority are excellent, but there's always going to be a handful of people who are charlatans who most of them are not even registrants. They're not even licensed to, 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 to sell you things because if they were registrants, you know, compliance departments and whatnot would shut them down and say, well, you, you simply can't tweet that. You have to delete it. We're, we're, we're taking away your privileges and so forth. But of course, there will always be some people who are just in their basement, have time on their hands, want attention, and they say things. And it's, it's interesting how many people will sort of uh, follow along. What, what I think is important is when you think about biases that we all have, humans all have biases, one of the uh, things that people want is they want to fit in. And there's a certain amount of groupthink that, that comes, comes to bear when you're making decisions uh, in a boardroom. That's groupthink when you try to make decisions. But there's also sort of th this notion of in-group favoritism, where if there are people who just want to hang around with other people that are in their tribe, it gives them comfort to be able to say, oh, these are my people. And now we have a situation where people that are inclined toward conspiracy theories and whatnot seek out others that, that have the same sort of inclination, and it creates an echo chamber that just amplifies the, uh, you know, the, the mindset. And it's, it's disconcerting yeah. societally. I think it's true. There's also a tendency for people, particularly more, how shall I put this? Not, I don't want to sound too critical, but people who are maybe a little vulnerable, mm -hmm. um, who perhaps think that life hasn't gone quite as well as it should have done for them. They look to blame others. And they're open to conspiracy theories and also the esoteric aspect. I have information other people don't have. So this idea that, you know, having worked in media for 40 years, conspiracies are very hard to cover up. You know, I've seen and I've worked at magazines in the UK um, where there were people there whose only job was to, to really expose things that were going on. If, if the president of the United States, Watergate, can be brought down, Pretty much anyone can be brought down so that if there is a major like Princess Diana, it was all a conspiracy. You honestly believe that the the British security services, well, even putting them aside, they're quite good. The royal family and their friends and so on, that it wouldn't have leaked. Something wouldn't have come out. There are people whose only job is, in media is to try and get hold of a story. And if you can get hold of a story, it will be published and you will win a Pulitzer Prize and you'll be rich and famous. But no, 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 it, it, it's deeper than that. It goes so deep. They, even the media, it's not true. I, I know media very, very well. If there is an incredible story, somebody will take it. But a lot of these conspiracies, they're not genuine. It's just, it's pretty sad people often who want to think that they know more than other people. And um, history... Human reality can be quite banal at times. Things happen because things happen. I mean, I, I deal a lot with people suffering and tragedy. And why did this happen, they will say. And obviously, I have to be very sympathetic and empathetic and sensitive. But really, the answer is there's no reason. There is no reason. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? Why do you know planes flying into towers? And I mean, we, we can read beyond the headlines. We can ask questions. But... Um, the Pope, Pope Francis, who, with all due respect, I don't think is a brilliant person. I mean, I think he's quite unworldly. I think he's a good man in many ways, many ways. But during uh, uh, the height of uh, Russia, Ukraine, he said that he didn't believe that Russians were committing these atrocities. It must be mercenaries because he'd read Russian literature. And, and you think, what? <laughs> hey, my, part of my family are from Russia and, and I'm very proud of a great uncle who fought throughout the Second World War in the Red Army, um, and in no mean not anti-Russian, but of course the Russians are capable of atrocity, and they committed atrocities. That he, a man of such influence, would say such a thing because he wanted it, yeah. and you have to be able to distinguish between the. I mean, my golly, look at German arts and culture, but look how they acted uh, at one period uh, of their. They've been a, a very ethical people, a very civilized people. And then after the Second World War, they returned to that. But that period in the 30s and 40s, they were barbaric beyond comprehension. So it it it, it always stuns me how credulous people can be when they want to be. There is a phrase in behavioral economics and in social psychology called motivated reasoning. And basically, what you've just explained is an example of motivated reasoning. People will believe what they want to believe for their own reasons. 
and they, they simply can't fathom that, that something that, that's, that's going on could be done by someone who they have a preconceived notion of, of being virtuous or, or being moral uh, would otherwise do. So um, I'm, I think I'm fairly optimistic about the future. I know your most recent book, The Rebel Christ, has a more of an optimistic viewpoint uh, toward things. Uh, but it's funny because even though I consider myself an optimist, my book talks about how optimism bias can threaten your finances. So I'm wondering if we could have a, a quick chat about your views on optimism, uh, what, the, what the future holds for the world, for humanity, and, uh, and maybe we can compare and contrast our views on what we can be optimistic about and, and maybe not so much. Well, I don't, um, I wouldn't say that my book was optimistic. I mean, it, it, it's, um, it's not really about optimism or pessimism. It, it, it's dealing with Christian issues from a progressive point of view. I'm an, I'm an optimist in that I, as a Christian, I believe the story, I already know the ending. It's all going to be okay. I believe in eternity. Um, am I optimistic about humanity? Um, I've, I'm an historian by training. No. Uh, genocide is repeated, barbarism is repeated, atrocity is repeated. So, I mean, I, I'm optimistic in that I see the most wonderful human kindness and charity and goodness every single day. But that doesn't mean I'm naive. I, I do think there will be there. There are some very worrying times ahead, uh, particularly right now. I think I see some elements emerging that that do concern me. I, th I think we have high points of of hope and optimism. Probably after the Second World War, the 50s, 60s, even 70s, people were very optimistic. Things began to change a bit. I think we've lost a sense of what community is. I think we've become a very fractionalized society. Uh, and certain groups um, with radical opinions that can be very oppressive and intolerant, both on, on the right and the left. And it, it always amazes me when people on the right complain about council culture. I've been a victim of council culture from the right. People on the right have counseled me. On the other hand, I've seen the hard left, not the mainstream, but I've seen the hard left at work trying to cancel other points of view. That's all deeply worrying, but that's not new. That's gone on for the longest time. Uh, um, the world is changing, and that's a good thing that can frighten and intimidate people. I'm optimistic in that I see young people. We have four children, and I see the way they behave. And I actually think that they're better than I, I mean. I wasn't that nice a young person in many ways, but I think they're better than me and better than my generation. Uh, I, I think they um, they have a sense of, un of tolerance and understanding. And uh, this notion that you know, young people, what's gone wrong? I don't think anything's gone wrong. I think actually it's gone very right. So in that way, I'm optimistic. And it's interesting because uh, when you look at what happened uh, in, for instance, the American midterms back in November, uh, it was the young children who, uh, Generation Z, uh, apparently, who voted more uh, uh, in favor of the the, you know, the center left candidates, but specifically who rejected the misinformation and the stolen steel narrative that was being promulgated by uh, certain candidates from the the Republican side. And there are pundits that are now saying that the main reason uh, the Democrats did better than people expected was because of the generation that up until very recently was too young to vote, making their voice heard, which I think supports your narrative. It's true. I mean, and also with Brexit in Britain, which I think was a disaster, uh, it was older people who voted, not uh, unanimously, but older people who voted Brexit and younger people who voted to stay in Europe. But do remember, um, younger people become older people. Right. And this is all we've, we've seen all this before. And, you know, people who have voted for centre, centre-left parties, as they get older, not always, but quite often there's a tendency to change their opinion and maybe move a bit to the right. So um, there's never an absolute when it comes to all this. I mean, it, we, we live in very cyclical and, and changing and mutable times. Right. So that brings up a question of morality. And you know, people say that morals are life lessons. And I'm wondering if um, you're a little bit older than I am, but probably um, maybe not as much, uh, not, not, not that much older than me than you might otherwise think. Uh, and, and I'm wondering if we start, uh, as we're all playing the back nine of our lives, if we reflect upon what our life lessons are, uh, as a person who is a, a, a modern day philosophical, philosopher and a, and a guiding light with regard to moral righteousness, 
what you think the, 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 the main moral lessons in life are as we, as we um, sit here at the end of 2022? Well, I mean, I don't think I'm, I'm that. I'm just an ordinary person trying his best. I do look back a great deal, though. Um, I'll be 64 quite soon. And uh, as I get older, I look back and I cringe the way I behaved um, often through my life. I've not been a particularly bad person, but as a, as a, a child, the way I treated my parents, it wasn't that bad, but it should have been a lot better. The way I've treated others, not that bad, but should have been better. So, I mean, I think you reflect more and more on those things. Um, and I'm not here to guide anyone as such. I mean, I, I, I came to, a, I suppose, what I'd like to think is, is a, um, a very vibrant and productive Christian faith about 10 years ago, even though I've been a Christian for many, many years. But I moved into, some, in a different, into a different form of it. And that does give me great hope and great optimism. Uh, as I said earlier, I think the story has been told. I, I believe that 2,000 years ago, um, God took on human form to, to die for us. Yeah. And I know that's all very religious and all that, but I, I believe it. And I think that the life lessons contained in the Gospels are, are timeless. Good. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm certainly an optimist, too, for the future. Uh, but it's funny because what we talked about a moment ago uh, is also part of what I think about. I think of it's great to be optimistic because you want to have something to look forward to. And there's a lot of research that shows that optimistic people are happier in life and they, they oftentimes yeah. live a longer life and a fuller life and a more fulfilling life. And those are all wonderful byproducts of being optimistic. But it's also important that we not um, wear rose-colored glasses as we go about our life and, right. and that we don't whistle past the graveyard and that we actually think about things and see things as they are so as to be able to address concerns, both real and perceived, uh, in a way that we don't get caught you know, looking the other way because it's just easier. So I, hopefully, hopefully the world will come to a place where we can all be you know, happier, uh, generally optimistic, but also you know, realistic as we go about our lives going forward. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, you mentioned that uh, whistling graveyard. I, I walked through a cemetery most yeah. days of the week where I work in, in a church, and it, it is sobering, really. And I've I've seen a lot of death in the past three years and been with people who are dying, and um, often with great faith, but dying is never something which is straightforward. It's very complex and nuanced, and, and you're leaving people behind. Um, I think a lot of people are optimistic. Often the people who, with the most optimism are those who have the least. Um, we in the West worry about a lot of things often. And I've met a lot of, well, not, not a lot, but I've met wealthy people who I wouldn't say are particularly happy, mm -hmm. uh, which I have some more money. That would be nice, but I've got enough. Mm -hmm. But as you know, I mean, it, it sounds rather facile, but um, there's no simple solution to happiness. Family and partnership and love, all these things are vital. Uh, I don't think I would find would have the happiness I have without my faith. I certainly wouldn't have it without my wife and family, grandchild now. All of these things are vitally important. But as you know, there have been surveys about this. Sometimes these fairly remote villages where there's not much possession around, but there is a great sense of happiness. People living longer and having a better quality of life, if you like. It's it's funny because you know uh, when when you do when you give advice to to investors and, and when you work with uh, p with other people on the money side, we we can quickly become linkered because that becomes the only thing we think about. We you know how do you keep score, and we use money as a as a proxy for happiness. And as you quite properly point out, there's so much more that goes into being happy than than the pile of money that you're sitting on at the end of the day. So it's uh, it's it's thank you for for making that point, because it's the sort of thing that a lot of us can, can lose sight of. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, so I, before we go, I, I wanted to ask you, there's a little format that I have uh, at the end of my podcast, uh, because the book is called Bullshift, where I invite the person that I'm talking to to um, think of something that they are unhappy with, and that's a section that I call, that's bullshit. Can you think of something, uh, Reverend Corin, that you're unhappy with? It doesn't normally it would be with regard to finance, but with you, I'll I'll go off the board. It can be anything at all that that you um, are unhappy with in the world that you see today. Well, we can we can make it financial if you like. Okay. Um, I'm incredibly unhappy with the fact that 
a very small number of people possess most of the world's wealth. Um, it's not only unethical and immoral, it's also very dangerous. But it, it's simply wrong that people, I realize some people earn their money through genius. Most people don't. Uh, luck, inheritance, whatever. Um, but even if they have through their brilliance, it, it's simply, um, objectively speaking, unfair. Um, and I wish every multimillionaire could drive very early on a snowy morning past a bus stop and watch the people lining up to go and clean offices or work in hospitals and consider how much money they're earning and what their lives are like financially and where they're living. And it, I don't want anyone to suffer. I don't want anyone to go without particularly. But if we change the tax system, if we change the system of redistribution of wealth, it would simply be a much better world. So that's what I would change financially. OK, so then that, that might bring us to the second half, which is shift happens. And shift happens is if you had something that you would do to deal with the problem that you just mentioned with bull shift, what would it be? And it sounds like you've already answered your own question. Is there anything else that you would change? How, how would you do it? Maybe, maybe we can ask you that. How would you go about um, redistributing wealth? Well, I'm not an economist, but I would certainly increase the minimum, minimum wage. Um, I would restructure the tax system. Um, I, people have a, a right to be very wealthy, but there's a certain point where you just say, well, you know, what are you doing with this money? And when one person is worth $44 billion, for example, I mean, this is just wrong. Um, you you also have to look at the the inner morality of someone who wants to possess that much wealth, who wouldn't simply give most of it away, because you could probably survive if you really pushed on maybe a billion dollars if you really had to. So, <laughs> I, I, and But also outside of the West, in, in the developing world, and there are places where people have absolutely nothing where they don't have clean running water they a disease and illness which will be routinely dealt with in this country would kill them and their family and I, we're community where we're made in the same way what unites us is so huge and what divides us is so small so i do think that um equal and just out of enlightened self-interest if we if there was more equality of possession and so on i think there'd be far less anger and uh, uh, but I don't claim to be an economist by training, but I have to say, knowing people who are very informed and educated in terms of economics, they never solve economic problems. Isn't that interesting? Right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, th th that's not an entirely optimistic note to end on, but it can be it, <laughs> because because it, it can also be the sort of thing where, you know, in a, if we can find a way to do these things, I think. I agree with you. The world would, would almost certainly be a better place. Uh, Hans Rosling has a book called Factfulness that talks about how literally billions of people have been lifted out of poverty, poverty in the past generation or two. And so we are making some progress and it's, not, are, it's not all lost. In India and elsewhere, yes. I mean, progress is being made, but we could do a lot more. And it's taken a long time to even try to do this. Right. So we need to do more. Reverend Michael Korn, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure. I look forward to speaking with you again at some point. Uh, it's been an honor to have you on the show, and I, I very much uh, want people to uh, to run out and buy your books and, and, and read your columns and follow you on Twitter and, and all of those things, because what you have to say is important. Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Bullshift, the podcast, was created in support of John DeGuey's book, Bullshift, available now online and in bookstores everywhere. The comments and opinions are those of the author and his guests. They are for informational purposes and should not be construed as investment advice. John DeGuey is an author, public speaker, senior investment advisor, and portfolio manager at Wellington Altus Private Wealth. For more information about John and his books, please visit standup.today. Bullshift, the podcast, is produced by TalkShoe, a division of IOTA.